This is the novel Red Harvest. It was completed in 1929 by the American writer Dashiell Hammett. The novel is said to be based loosely on Hammett's experiences while working as an operative for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Butte, Montana was one of the places he was assigned. The novel is regarded as a watershed in the development of the crime genre. Some have gone so far as to describe it as revolutionary. The book is marked by the austere immediacy of its style and for its suffusion with pitiless violence. The action is set in a vanquished western mining town. The town once thrived, but has now been overtaken by opportunists and criminals of every stripe. It is in the grip of organized crime. The catalyst for this transformation is the struggle undertaken by those who own the mining company against the organizing efforts of a radical union. Though the book is a work of fiction, there is no doubting its real inspiration. Hammett called his fictional town Poisonville. He couldn't guess how it would resound 70 years later. It is 1864. The Montana Territory is carved out of Idaho and a colonial economy is adopted. From the inception of the territory, all of Montana's salient industries are extractive. According to this model, the object is to trap it, shoot it, mine it, and get out. In the century and a half that follows, this model will never be successfully challenged. Soon after its founding, Miners from the depleted gold fields of California and Colorado begin to migrate into the new territory. They are fueled by unrequited dreams and found a mining camp that will one day become Butte. It is 1873. The gold boom has fallen into a bust. The restless population of the territory has now shifted to the Dakotas. Butte is described as a deplorable place no newspaper, no church, and only a single school. It has been reduced to little more than primitive shacks and muddy paths. The town of Butte, not yet fully born, is nearly left for dead. It is 1882. The age of electricity has dawned. A massive body of copper is discovered below the hills of Butte. Because copper is essential to electrification, Butte begins to boom. The town is soon crowded with new arrivals. The company that will soon rule Butte is founded and takes the name of a famed predator. It is 1889. The War of the Copper Kings has begun. In this struggle, competing owners try to challenge Anaconda's domination of the mines of Butte. Soon after, the first union of the Butte miners, the Western Federation of Miners, is founded, and the owners, weakened by their internecine struggle, yield unprecedented strength to the union. Butte is dubbed the Gibraltar of unionism. It is 1903. Anaconda emerges as sole victor in the War of the Copper Kings. The mines now generate unprecedented wealth for the company. As a result, Butte has become the political and economic capital of the region. It is said that Anaconda is an aptly named company. It seeks to strengthen its grip on the town. The company purchases newspapers, rigs elections, and bribes public officials. Judges and other agents of law enforcement likewise fall under company control. Historians have said, any approximately accurate history of the state must be, in the large part, the story of modern feudalism. But this is incorrect. Anaconda soon turns its attention to the sole remaining obstacle to its absolute domination of Butte. It is 1905 and in Chicago, a radical union is founded. It will seek to organize all workers within one union, rather than to divide them by trade. 
unity of action, its members believe, is the key to workers' power. The radical union will seek to organize those workers ignored by the other unions. Organizers will labor among migrant farmers, timber workers, and hard rock miners. They will fight for immediate demands, better wages, safer working conditions, secure employment. But members of the radical union will always fight for something else as well. They will fight for a different kind of world. The union calls itself the IWW, the industrial workers of the world. But its members are also known as the Wobblies. The new union adopts, as its symbol, the black cat. And this is appropriate. The cat is an animal with which we do not have a master-servant relationship. It is 1912. Anaconda has wrested control of the union from the miners. The rustling card has replaced the union card and is issued only to the most responsible men, men who are not disturbers and agitators. Anaconda can withdraw the card at any time for any reason. For example, 500 miners are fired summarily after being labeled socialists. Thus, the blacklist is first implemented in Butte. Meanwhile, laws regarding safety in the mines are ignored. Tuberculosis accounts for nearly one-third of all deaths in Butte. The miners and their families live and work in deplorable conditions. It is 1914. The transformation of Butte continues apace. The once mighty union has now been perched from the mines. The town has been partitioned into two distinct encampments. The few reside in a bustling, cosmopolitan, and prosperous enclave, while the sector populated by Butte's majority is overcrowded, unsanitary, and dangerous. Federal forces and the declaration of martial law have been deemed necessary to quell unrest. The town remains under military occupation. Though the price of copper has increased fourfold, wages remain unchanged since the previous century. The cost of living in Butte is impossibly high. It is 1917, the transformation of Butte is complete. From closed shop to open shop, from union card to rustling card, from collective bargaining to individual bargaining, from trade agreements to no agreements whatsoever, from mutual need and goodwill to riots and militia patrolled streets, from cooperation and affection to hate and mistrust, from 17,500 union miners to 17,500 disorganized miners. It is summer. Washington has joined the Great War. Copper is essential to the war drive, and the mines of Butte produce 10% of the world's copper. Thus, the war is generating millions for the company. Nonetheless, the opponents of war are numerous in Butte. Many are Irish immigrants who detest the thought of fighting on behalf of their colonizers. Others blame the war on the greed of war profiteers. Consider the following. At the height of the World War, the mines of Butte produce more than 30% of the nation's copper and more than 10% of the world's copper. Copper is essential to the war drive, no less than munitions or bodies. Because Anaconda owns the mines of Butte, the company wields tremendous power on a national scale as well. The company uses this considerable influence to inflate the price of copper sold to the government. Copper is essential to the war drive, no less than munitions or bodies, so the government pays. And Anaconda extracts millions from what is needed to wage war. This is what is meant by the old-fashioned phrase, war profiteering. And how can a company making millions from war ever oppose such a war? Such explanations of the First World War are now said to be inadequate. But even now, who can truly explain the causes of that war?
in which the cold efficiencies of industry finally collided head-on with the savage capacities of humankind. The rate of mortality is higher in the mines of Butte than in the trenches of Europe. Production continues as the town remains under occupation. Xenophobia and a constant fear of violence pervade Butte. It is the 8th of June. Fire is triggered in a shaft called the Speculator. Flames spread rapidly through ventilation shafts and the Speculator is soon engulfed. Word of the fire reaches town quickly and thousands make their way to the site. The rescue work continues for days. In order to keep the work going, rescuers are offered whiskey at the mouth of the mine. They will discover the dead piled against cement bulkheads, and most are charred beyond recognition. State law specifies that the bulkheads must have doors which can be opened in the case of fire or collapse. The fingers of the dead are said to be worn to the knuckles. It is clear the law is ignored in the minds of Butte. One hundred and sixty-four finally perish in the fire. It is the worst mining accident in the nation's history. Butte has for some time been a volcano on the point of eruption, and the heavy toll of life in the speculator catastrophe proves to be the flaming torch. It is the 11th of June. The mines are idled by a massive strike. The miners are joined on the pickets by the trade unions. A new miners union is founded. The Metal Mine Workers Union soon issues its demands. 16,000 workers observe the pickets. Company papers assert that the strike is part of a conspiracy led by German agents with the intention of aiding the enemy. Company papers predict violence, yet no violence among the strikers is seen or is reported. Nevertheless, Anaconda refuses to recognize the new miners' union. It will close the mines down, flood them, and not raise a pound of copper before it will recognize the anarchist leaders of the new union. The company then seeks to isolate the miners by offering better contracts to the trade unions, and the trade unions accept the offer. The workers of Butte are divided, and Anaconda seems poised for victory, but a new factor is introduced to the equation. 
It is 1879. An agitator is born in Oklahoma. He is named Frank Little. There are few extant details of his life. He is born of a white father and a Cherokee mother. He will later be described as half white, half Indian, and all IWW. He joins the Radical Union and dedicates himself to the class struggle. He has three brothers and two sisters who will join him as agitators. He is a fearless and indefatigable organizer. His name is inseparable from the struggles which mark the era. Bisbee, the Great Central Valley, the Iron Range, and finally Butte. He is jailed repeatedly. He connects the fight for free speech with the class struggle. Because of the role of money in our society, free speech is not free. If we cannot speak, how can we discuss? And if we cannot discuss, how can we invent? Frank Little is an outspoken opponent of the Great War. War will mean the end of everything he has ever fought for. Free speech, a free press, free assembly. He will take the firing squad first. While agitating among the miners of Iron River, his future is foreshadowed. He is assigned by the Radical Union to agitate among the miners of Butte. He departs from Montana at the age of 38. He bears the scars of struggles elsewhere. It is the 18th of July, 1917. The agitator arrives by train. The day after his arrival, he is invited to speak to a gathering of the striking miners, and more than 6,000 come to hear him speak. He addresses immediate goals. He describes an image of a different kind of world. Company papers describe his remarks as a treasonable tirade. Under a headline which reads, Soldiers Called Armed Thugs, they write, Frank Little, Arizona strike leader, practically threatened the United States government with revolution. 6,000 men filled the bleachers to overflowing and listened to Little's remarks. The frail man worked himself into a maniacal fury as he denounced the capitalists of every class and nationality. Little intimated a worldwide revolution of the working classes. After Little's first appearance, the papers reiterate their prediction of violence. On July 25th, the agitator is invited to address closed meetings of the miners' union. 
These meetings are said to be comprised in equal parts of laborers and company spies. The agitator discusses tactics. We have no set rules to go by, but we are organized. And when we call a strike, we must use any means necessary to win that strike. That's the reason the boss doesn't like us. He can't handle us, and he knows that we will handle him in the near future. Use any means necessary. It doesn't matter what those means are, but use them to win your strike. On July 27th, the agitator is invited to address the miners for a second time. On this occasion, 6,500 are said to attend. He addresses immediate goals. He describes an image of a different kind of world. He is said to have described Woodrow Wilson as a lying tyrant. He is said to have claimed that the Radical Union was willing to go to war against the capitalists, but not the Germans. He is said to have claimed that the Constitution of the United States was nothing more than a scrap of paper, which can be torn up like any other when the authorities deem it necessary. All of the accounts of the public speeches of the agitator and all of the accounts of the closed meetings of the Union come from company papers and company spies. Thus, company history becomes official history. There are, however, texts written by the agitator. Perhaps they more accurately represent what he might have said to the striking miners. Within days, Anaconda seeks to silence the agitator by use of the Espionage Act, but discovers that he cannot be prosecuted under existing law. Company papers then run the headline. It is the early morning hours of August 1st, 1917. Anaconda fulfills its prophecies of violence. Informants reveal where the agitator can be found. He sleeps among the workers in a boarding house known as the Steel Block. Six masked men emerge from a large black car. They enter the boarding house and awaken the landlord. They say, we are officers and we want little. The landlord points towards room 32. The door is kicked in. The agitator is dragged to the waiting car. He remains silent and offers minimal resistance. Still dressed in his underwear, he is tied to the bumper of the car. 
The car then drives to the outskirts of the city, dragging the agitator the full distance. Bruises on his skull indicate that he was beaten severely. Before being hanged from a railroad trestle, a placard is pinned to his underwear. It bears the inscription, Others Take Notice, First and Last Warning, 3-7-77. The numbers are said to date from the territorial era and to represent vigilante justice. They are the dimensions of a Montana grave, three feet wide by seven feet long, by 77 inches deep. The agitator had come to Butte to speak to the striking miners and to describe an image of a different kind of world. He is lynched by persons still unknown. All that we know of Frank Little's time in Butte and all that we know regarding his murder comes from company papers and company spies. Thus, official history is company history. It is the aftermath of the murder as the agitator is laid to rest, the town is suffocating under a constant threat of escalating violence. Some say every man, woman, and child in the country knows who perpetrated the crime. Some say the Indians of Montana are again rising in rebellion. Some say good work. Let them continue to hang every IWW in the state. As many as 8,000 people march in the largest funeral procession in the history of the town. The coroner's jury reports that the agitator was murdered by persons unknown. No one is ever arrested for the crime. All of the documents relating to the murder, including the coroner's reports themselves, have disappeared. It is said that the murder was carried out to provoke the miners into violence. It is said that the authorities sought a pretext for the imposition of martial law. Among the striking miners and their supporters, no violence is seen or is reported. Nonetheless, martial law is declared in Butte. Leaders of the Radical Union are arrested. With the assistance of the occupying forces, the strike is crushed. And thus the future of the town is nearly settled. Did the workers of Butte support the ideas of Frank Little? This is difficult to say, but consider the following. Little was one of many union organizers who came to Butte during the strife of 1917, but he was the only outside organizer invited to address large public gatherings of the striking miners and their supporters. On both occasions, he spoke publicly in Butte. It is reported that more than 6,000 people were present to hear his remarks. Further. Frank Little was the only outside organizer allowed to attend and to speak at closed meetings of the Metal Mine Workers' Union. Finally, Frank Little's funeral was, and remains, the largest funeral in Butte history, with as many as 8,000 people participating. Did the workers of Butte support the ideas of Frank Little?
The murder of the agitator becomes a pretext for expanded violence against the radical union. First, the union hall is raided and the local leaders of the union are jailed. Then, 15 members of the radical union are shot while picketing along Anaconda Road. But these local acts are only a prelude. First, the Montana Espionage Act is rewritten into the Montana Sedition Act. Then, the Montana Sedition Act is rewritten to become the National Sedition Act. According to the new laws, members of the Radical Union or similar organizations can be arrested and deported as enemy aliens. Strikes that interfere with the war drive are made criminal. Sedition is defined as uttering disloyal words and is made criminal. Thought, belief, and association are made criminal. Mass arrests and deportations begin almost immediately. Mere weeks after the murder of Little in Butte, the Radical Union is targeted in a massive indictment. As if to assist us in connecting the dots, though Frank Little is already cold in the ground, his name is included in the indictment. More than 100 wobbly organizers are convicted of espionage and sentenced from 5 to 20 years in the federal penitentiary. In the following year, the Palmer Raids begin, and the repressions become more acute. In January of 1920 alone, more than 10,000 members of radical organizations are arrested in raids on 70 cities. Hundreds of foreign-born members are summarily deported. American members face trial, massive fines, and lengthy prison terms. Should we still miss the obvious, history offers us a clue as to the nature of the repression set into motion in the hard rock mines of the American West. Among those named in the indictments, and later sentenced to five years in Leavenworth, is a man named Joseph McCarthy. That which we call McCarthyism existed both before and after its namesake. Its sharpest effects were felt in the arenas of public discourse, in the schools, and in the theaters. It was and is, first and foremost, an impulse towards the suppression of ideas themselves. That which we call McCarthyism is with us still. It is present in the mutilated landscapes of our industrial past and in the impoverished discourse regarding our future. It is 1917, and the nation has for some time been a volcano on the point of eruption. The murder of the agitator proves to be the flaming torch. It now seems clear. The journey towards McCarthyism passes along Anaconda Road. And in this manner, the black heart of Montana becomes the black heart of the nation. Or, to put it another way, in a rare instance of a slogan made literal, an injury to one becomes an injury to all.
It is 1951, the height of McCarthyism. The crime novelist Dashiell Hammett is jailed for refusing to name names. He had once served as an agent of Anaconda. Now he is labeled a traitorous red. His closest friend, the playwright Lillian Hellman, later explains. During his Pinkerton days, an officer of the Anaconda Copper Company had offered Hammett $5,000 to kill Frank Little. It seems one can date Hammett's belief that he was living in a corrupt society from Little's murder. In time, he came to the conclusion that nothing less than a revolution could wipe out the corruption. Sometimes in complex minds, it is the plainest experience that speeds the wheels that have already begun to move. It is November 1995. A large flock of migrating geese is overtaken by a sudden storm. In these circumstances, it is the instinct of geese to set down on the nearest body of water. Anaconda has long since abandoned the town. Butte was once called the richest hill on earth. It is estimated that at least $25 billion have been extracted from the mines of Butte. When Anaconda fled, it carried those billions with them. Likewise, it took the thousands of jobs once created by the mines. But the company did leave something. The town now has the distinction of being the most polluted site in the nation. The ecological catastrophe is embodied by the Berkeley Pit. Though it was once the world's largest open pit copper mine, the pit now lies unused. In the last years of its operation, it quite literally began to consume the town. Where the pit now stands, there were neighborhoods of modest homes and a beloved park. Now they are gone, and the pit sits idle like an open wound. Slowly but surely, the pit is filling with water. The so-called Lake Berkeley is now the largest body of severely contaminated water in the United States. Standing nearly a mile wide and more than 900 feet deep, the water is laced with copper, cadmium, zinc, nickel, lead, arsenic, and sulfates in concentrations several thousands of times more than those found in uncontaminated water. The pH level of the water is around 2.5, roughly comparable to battery acid. There is now a proposal, only partly ironic, to have Butte named the first National Environmental Disaster Monument. Yet, despite everything, the town endures. Many of Butte's inhabitants have been forced to move on. but a resilient few have chosen to remain. Like people everywhere, they labor.
they play. They do what they must to survive. The town's residents continue to dream of a different kind of future. But sometimes they're still forced to contend with the past and with the predator that left their town for dead. For example, it is said that until recently, cats could not survive in Butte because the dirt they claimed from their fur was poisoned with arsenic. For example, it is November 1995. The geese have begun their seasonal migration. A large flock is overtaken by a sudden storm. In these circumstances, it is the instinct of geese to set down on the nearest body of water. The morning following the storm, 342 geese are discovered floating dead in the water. The carcasses are found with their feathers matted. They are blistered with lesions and are suffering from a range of internal injuries, including corroded esophagy and trachea. Their livers and kidneys are bloated with toxic levels of copper, manganese, zinc, and cadmium. The predator has itself been consumed, and a new company, Arco, now owns what is left of the mines. But some things haven't changed, and representatives of the new company assure residents that the water is safe. They are certain. The geese died because of something they ate. Others have attributed the deaths to a new phenomenon called pit effect. Dashiell Hammett had called his fictional town Poisonville. He couldn't guess how it would resound 70 years later. The history of the events of 1917 is difficult to reassemble. Much of the evidence has been destroyed or has disappeared. This includes all of the files pertaining to the murder of Frank Little, the police dossier, and the coroner's report. On order of the federal courts, all of the documents pertaining to the mass arrests and prosecutions of the leadership of the IWW were burned. Dashiell Hammett's role in the murder of Frank Little likewise remains an enigma. All of the documents pertaining to the role of the Pinkerton Detective Agency in the sabotage of the labor movement, including the case reports of Hammett, were said to be lost in a fire. Much of the evidence has thus been destroyed or has disappeared. Much, but not all. As the geese help to demonstrate, history, in this case, cannot be so easily expurgated. In an act reminiscent of a mass suicide, the geese hurled themselves into the open wound in the heart of the town. Perhaps, using the only manner they knew, these creatures were trying to tell us something. Because it seemed to have escaped our notice, they were directing us to the scene of a crime.
started in 1955 was a large truck-operated open pit copper mine until mining closed in 1982. By 1980, nearly one and a half billion tons of material had been removed from the pit, including more than 290 million tons of copper ore. The pit is 7,000 feet long, 5,600 feet wide, and 1,600 feet deep from the high wall on the north side just below the Kelly Mine. During underground mining, water from the mine shafts was pumped to the surface. When Anaconda shut down its underground operations in 1982, the pumping system was abandoned. Groundwater began to rise through the several thousand miles of interconnected tunnels, honeycombing the Butte Hill, seeping into the pit. The pit water is acidic due to the contact of the water with mineralized ore zones. To keep birds from landing on the water in the pit, flares, shell crackers, and electronic noisemakers are being used. The pit water at the moment is about 950 feet deep. Toward the mountains on your right is the Continental Pit, which is being mined seven days a week, 24 hours a day, for copper and molybdenum. Welcome to Butte.